be saved tonight, say amen. amen. It's great to be in the house of God. And uh, how do you rather be here than in the best hospital in Baltimore? Amen. And uh, I'm glad you're so happy to be in church tonight. And uh, I know some of the men, Pastor, you made all those announcements about the balcony and, uh, and upstairs in the second floor. And man, they, they during those announcements, men were getting sick all over the building and uh, didn't make it back tonight. But I appreciate the good faithful men that are here tonight and uh, willing to work, willing to get involved. And uh, I know this project will be done. I have no doubt about it that it'll be done by next Saturday, maybe even before that, and uh, appreciate all the goodness of the Lord and the hard work of God's people for uh, His work to go forward. And uh, by the way, the Bible says, be steadfast, unmovable, always abounding in the what? Next word work of the Lord. And that's where some people quit out. Well, it's good to be spiritual. It's good to be godly. Praise the Lord. Amen. Uh, good to read the Bible and all that. But when it comes to work, suddenly they fall out. But I'm glad this crowd is ready to go and stir up about it. And uh, Pastor, my knee is really bothering me and my back hurts and all. So I have to leave right after service. But you all have a good time. Uh, no, I really do have a prior commitment uh, that I need to keep or else I'd maybe even consider helping out 
about myself. I helped the church uh, last year, and uh, they were in a renovation. I came in on Saturday, so we were crawling around, laying, putting baseboard down, and uh, laying it down the edges, and, and all that, having a good time running trim. And there was a man behind me, was a deacon, and he started crying. I said, you all right? He said, no. He said, sir, uh, excuse me. He said, I've never seen a preacher work before. <laughs> and I, I said, well, uh, he was serious as could be. He was crying. He had an emotional moment. He said, man, this is great. And, uh, you know, hey, preachers work too. Amen? And I know your pastor will be, uh, it's going to be hard to keep him out of that second floor. But you men are going to do a good job of doing that. Amen? You're going to help keep him away from that project. I have an amen. Uh, that's a very important thing. Uh, so he can heal up, get better. You all get this for him and get it done and encourage him and strengthen him in the Lord. And I, I know he'd be crawling around, laying carpet, all that if he could. And he will be in a couple of weeks when he gets better. And uh, Pastor, you have just, uh, it's an amazing thing that God's used you to do here in this place. And I was talking to one of my relatives today. I said, you have no idea none what this church was when Pastor Giovanelli came. It's exciting to come in, look around, see all the decorations and uh, the beautiful screens up and all that, and just see the good things that have happened around here and see hundreds of people coming in on Sunday morning. Some people had never had the privilege and to see all the way from the beginning, but I have, and uh, I remember what it was like, and uh, I'm grateful for the goodness of God and for give, bringing a good man of God here to pay the price and do whatever it takes to see this church go forward. And by the way, it's a great price to come into an area like Dundalk, Maryland. Great price tag to see revival, to see souls saved. That's what's happening in your pastor's body. He's paying a great price to see uh, the hand of God go forward upon this place. And you need to stand with him and stay behind him uh, while he recuperates and cover, recovers. And uh, just make it easy. I was with a church last week, and they just went through a battle. The pastor went away on vacation. And, uh, and I said, I just got one word for you all. While he's away, behave. Amen? Uh, act like like Christians. Now he'll be back next week. I said then you can backslide and act like the devil, but act right while your pastor's getting better. And for your pastor, you all need to behave and uh, just stand in and help him to get better. Make it easy. And I'm looking forward uh, to seeing uh, him up and at it again, stirred up. Wish I could be here next week. You'll be preaching like a wild man next Sunday. And uh, that'll be a great day to see him back in the pulpit again. It is a privilege to be here. It's also a privilege to be supported by this church. Church. And uh, two weeks ago, we had a great Sunday in uh, Cheyenne, Wyoming. Pastor Mark Rossi, no relation whatsoever, but uh, Pastor Mark Rossi there at Lighthouse Baptist Church. And uh, I spent the weekend with him. And uh, we got out there and just had a great time. He told me, Brother Rossi, I believe we're going to have maybe 400 people on the grounds. They did a big day. They worked at it. Their church is, runs about 80 or 90 people. They did. They had 390, I think, eight people on the grounds. It was incredible. It was a roundup Sunday. It uh, had the auditorium packed. 28 adults got saved, or 28 uh, people got saved in the main auditorium. 32 kids got saved over in Children's Church. And, uh, we had more than 60 people saved on the ground on Sunday morning. And uh, you all were a part of all that uh, by helping support us and be behind us and help keep us in the ministry. The love offerings that we get are a great blessing, but we literally could not live off the love offerings we receive. Uh, we couldn't live on that. A few weeks ago, I preached in a church. We had a great Sunday, well, a great four-day revival meeting, wonderful time together. Uh, we had to drive 400 miles to get there. Stayed there for four days, left there. They gave me a check for $432 for the week. It cost me almost that much to get there and back. And so he said, brother, God's been good. Gave, got a good offering for you. I almost cried when I got in the car. I'm just glad that churches like this have stood behind us and made it all possible to have an amen. Uh, we were in the church the next week and uh, had a great offering, and it met needs. And so uh, it's little, few, in between 
mean? And uh, a pastor called me recently and said, Brother, uh, how much do you charge to come preach on Sundays? I said, Well, normally about $8,000 on a Sunday. Uh, uh, he said, How much do you charge? And uh, I said, Sir, we never charge. We never set a price tag, never set a precedent. We trust God and He meets every need. And uh, we're able to do that because churches like this stand behind us and uh, we're grateful. I was going to come up and start stumbling and stuttering because, uh, man, something's breaking out on this platform. Uh, starting over here with Brother Fanatic, all the way over here, Brother Robinson, they were all stuttering around, but I don't know if it was a plague, but at least the pastor straightened it all out uh, when he got up, and uh, so we're grateful for that. Turn in your Bibles, please, the book of 1 Corinthians chapter number 16. 1 Corinthians chapter 16. I wanted to preach tonight from the book of Galatians where Paul said, I bear in my body the marks of the Lord Jesus. I'm going to preach that another time. I'll preach that at another hour. This afternoon I had something on my mind and heart. In 1 Corinthians chapter 16, verse number 13. I've got many, many calls throughout this week, many calls, all the way back to last Sunday night. And my phone has been lit up, I've been driving a lot, Susan and Bethany and I have been on the road for two weeks, we've been traveling, going from place to place, been very, very active and busy. But all this week my phone has been ringing about some events that have occurred in several churches where some well-known men have fallen and are no longer in the ministry. I never rejoice in phone calls like that, and neither should you. Do I have an amen? amen. I've had some men who've called me and made jokes and kidded around about it, and uh, these are not laughing matters. These are dangerous days. Do I have an amen? And understand, we all, all of us could say clearly with the Apostle Paul, let him that thinketh he standeth take heed lest he fall. Do I have an amen? amen? You say, preacher, I could never do this or I would never do that. What you ought to say is, there go I, but by the grace of God. Amen. There are several extremes when people fail. Some people go way out on one extreme of immediately wanting to give so much mercy and grace. Oh, we just need to love them and pray for them and all, and give an overdose of grace where we act like sin did not occur. That is not a proper response. The other response is, of course, to go out and get some stones and find people and stone them and kill them and beat them about the head. That is not a proper response. God always has the right response if we'll study His precious Word. When people around us fall, when people around us fail, it ought to be a warning to all of us to watch over one another, to pray much, to seek the face of God, and more than anything else, these failures ought to cause all of us to want to draw near to God and be a greater Christian than we've ever been in our life. How many want to serve Christ with your life? How many want to finish? The, this course and finish this battle. Do I have an amen? Get to the place where we all say and hear those wonderful words, well done, good and faithful servant. I'd like to speak for a little while in 1 Corinthians chapter 16 and verse number 13, and I would give you my response to what happens when there are moral failures, spiritual failures, when things around us crumble and collapse. There's not a month of my life that goes by that I hear about either a failure or a, a downturn in some church or another. I hear about splits. I hear about problems. Last week I was in a well-known church, walked in, and the secretary said, well, Brother Rossi, we've just had a split. I hear these things on a regular basis. In fact, very few people call me up and tell me how good it is. They call me when it's all bad. Amen? But, uh, but I'm saying our response to all these things should always be the same. Let's stand together as we look at 1 Corinthians 16, verse number 13. Watch ye, 
Stand fast in the faith. Quit you like men. Be strong. Let's read that out loud together. Watch ye. Stand fast in the faith. Quit you like men. Be strong. And for a few moments tonight, I'd like to look at that phrase that occurs in the middle of that verse. And I want to speak for a little bit, not long because of the project and all that's going on. We'll just have a sermonette and uh, dismiss. All right, no sermonette. Sermonettes are preached by little preacherettes to little Christianettes who live in, in bassinets and smoke cigarettes. Anyway, uh, instead I'm going to preach for a little bit on a very simple subject. I want to preach on the subject of quit you like men. Quit you like men. You say, preacher, is this for men? It is. But the term here is a generic term. It means men, but it's all encompassing. And I want to speak on that subject tonight. Quit you like men. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Father, thank you for the Word of God. We pray your blessing to reside upon it. And again, we acknowledge our great need for thee. Thank you for the good time, the wonderful service this morning. And we thank you for the souls that were saved and lives that are changed. Thank you for a soul-winning church. And God, I praise you for that very term, a soul-winning church. We pray you'll continue to bless Calvary Baptist. May many be one to Christ in the days ahead. Thank you for that, what you're doing. For it's in Jesus' name we pray. All of God's people said, Amen. You may be seated. Thank you for standing for so long. Our text tonight is a great uh, admonition that we find in the Word of God. If you study this out, you'll find that the Apostle Paul is writing a conclusive chapter to the church which is at Corinth. He gives them many exhortations throughout this chapter and the ones preceding it, but he begin, begins in this verse of Scripture to give them one verse with four important Bible directives and four important Bible commands. He says, watch ye, quit ye, watch ye, stand fast in the faith, quit you like men, be strong. He simply reminds them of a very important truth, and I'd like to give those to you uh, tonight. First of all, he says, watch ye. He said, you need to watch over your life. You need to watch over those around you. Watch ye is a military metaphor that means to stand guard in the same way a sentinel stands uh, guard during his duty time. He is on duty. He is not to leave his post. He is to watch over the other men that are sleeping. And the Bible makes it very clear that you and I are to watch over our faith and watch over those around us tonight. That's what the Bible said in 1 Peter 5, 8, be sober, be vigilant, because your adversary the devil walketh about as a roaring lion seeking whom he may devour. We have an enemy tonight who hates everything about you. Do I have an amen? We have an enemy who hates your family, an enemy who hates your health, an enemy who hates your money and your finances financial uh, welfare. He hates everything about your personal life. You have an enemy called the devil, and God wants you to watch and be careful and to stand fast in your faith. If you study uh, 1 Corinthians, you'll find out there are a number of things Paul really was referring to. We need to, as the people of God, we need to watch, uh, watch over division. In 1 Corinthians chapter 1 and verse 10, he said that you all speak the same thing thing that there be no division among you. It is easy to get divided. It is easy in a project like you're uh, embarking on this week, only a six, seven day project, not a huge endeavor, but even in that project, men will get their feelings hurt. Women will get mad because they didn't get to pick the carpet out. People will get upset because they didn't get to carry their favorite chair down to the trailer. And people get upset about the most mundane and ridiculous things, and then it blows 
blows up and becomes problems down at the house of God. Many people leave a church like this over the most ridiculous things. Do I have an amen? They don't leave necessarily over the doctrine of the Word of God. They don't leave over the preaching of the Word of God. They leave because they lost their favorite seat or they leave because someone didn't recognize them for a special number or because they didn't get to sing. A man came to me and said, Brother Rossi, uh, you know, you're the pastor back when I pastored and said, Brother Rossi, why can't I sing a special number? I finally waxed bold and said, because you can't sing. Do I have an amen? You're a terrible singer. You're horrible. Let's just get it over with. And, and I can't wait until heaven when those grannies who told some little kid that they could sing who can't sing, uh, they're going to be rebuked one day. Amen. It'll all straighten out. But we get so upset over the most ridiculous stuff. And uh, why didn't the pastor let me pick out the new carpeting? Because he's been to your house. Amen. And he saw yours and he knows you can't match colors. But understand that we need to watch over division. He said we're to watch over defilement. He said in chapter 5 verses 1 through 5, he said it is reported commonly that there is fornication among you. And then he began to describe the fact that in the church at Corinth they had incest and ungodliness of which I cannot even describe tonight. Understand we need to be careful lest we be defiled. Do I have an amen? Watch over it. Watch over. Watch ye over division, over defilement, over disorder. Much of this chapter and much of this book of the Bible is written to place order in the local church. I'm glad they're not just going to go up there and say, okay boys, let's tear it all apart. You'd have total chaos. There are men assigned to watch over the men and give direction and have plans of how to take it out and how to put the furniture back in and when the carpet goes down, everything in life requires order. Do I have an amen to that? 1 Corinthians 14, 40, the Bible said, let all things be done decently and in order. Then, of course, to watch over doctrine. Much of this book of 1 Corinthians deals with false teaching and deceivers and men would come in and lead the flock astray. Friends, you can write this down. Usually when a man's life is messing up, he starts preaching and teaching things that are contrary to the Word of God. And friends, we need to be careful that we take heed to ourselves and to the doctrine. Say amen. And so the Bible says, let God be true. Let every man be a liar. And I don't care how much pizza you ate at night. I don't care what kind of a dream or a vision you had. If it's contrary to the Bible, you need to lay it aside and we need to watch over our doctrine as the people of God. He said, watch ye, stand fast in the faith. The second phrase, the word to stand face fast means, quote, to keep in rank in for unity and preservation. Adam Clark said that. He said, quote, keep in your ranks. On your unity, your preservation depends. If the enemy succeeds in breaking your ranks and dividing one part of this sacred army from another, your route will be inevitable. In other words, just stand. You know, it really does matter that you are in church tonight. You say, what's the difference? I'll tell you the difference. There are certain people here that look over when they see you in your place, it encourages them to stay in theirs. There are some here tonight that when they watch you being faithful to the things of God, faithful with the building program, with the project, when they look over and see you put an offering envelope into the plate, when they see you at soul winning time, when you are in your place, it really does matter tonight. For the Bible says we're a member one of another. And he said we're to stand fast in the faith. It literally means to hold the line. The Bible said in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2 verse number 15, Therefore, brethren, stand fast and hold to, the hope, to your hope unto the end. And so you and I as God's men and God's women, I can tell you this tonight, it doesn't matter if every leader in America falls tomorrow, our faith is still in place, our Savior is still on the throne. Our God is still in heaven. Say amen to that. And he said, watch ye stand fast in the faith. And then he said, quit you like man. There is only one place in the whole New Testament where this little phrase is found. It's nowhere else in the Bible where God says, quit you like man. I wasn't sure what this meant. 
I've looked up every commentary and Bible uh, dictionary that I own to find out what does God really say and what does He mean when He says to all of us, quit you like man. I found one definition that says to render oneself manly or brave. How many of you like bravery? How many of you like chivalry? Do I have an amen? How do you like to get around a man? I'm not talking about a guy who shows up to church with a 357 strapped on and says, I'm Rambo, brother. I'm not talking about a maniac for God. I'm talking about a man who is genuinely brave and chivalrous. And by the way, genuinely brave men usually don't talk about how brave they are. They don't run around with their chest puffed out and say, come on, dude, let's go right now. They're not looking for a fight. They are just simply gentle men of God, who walk with Christ, who act like a man. This word quit you like men means to show oneself as a man. And one writer said this, just simply these words, quit you like man means to act man-like. How many of you believe that men ought to act man-like? Do I have an amen? I mean, we ought to act and, and show ourselves as men. In the vernacular, we could simply say, quit you like men means to man up. You've heard that word. Let's man up, boys. We're tired, Pastor. It's 1130. We can't get the carpet out. Man up, dudes. Shake it off. Let's go. Let's keep on moving. Let's keep on working. It means that we're going to do what other people won't do in order for the job to be done because we are men of God. And Brothers, I can tell you this tonight, and ladies, you and I are in the last hour and the last moments of the last days, and because of that, it is time for some of God's men to just flat man up. Do I have an amen? amen. And then he says, be strong. Be strong. And that's very simple. Where God said in Ephesians 6:10, finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord and in the power of His might. I've watched in my lifetime, I'm only 55 years old, I know I look a lot younger than that, but I have watched in my lifetime, I have watched America change. I have watched the feminist movement with their uh, ungodly agenda of feminizing America. I have watched as men, as men have become weak and women have become strong. Now the new prototype young woman at the age of 21, she drives a slick black car, she's got a Starbucks car holder up there on the front. She's got her workout uh, outfit in the gym bag in the back seat. She pulls into Gold's Gym. She gets there after her day at work, throws on her little outfit. She's working out. She's pumping iron. She's lifting weights. Brother, she's got a Glock 9 hooked on the side. <laughs> Goes to the shooting range. She's got karate going on, taekwondo, and no man is going to tell her what to do. Amen to that? You say, hey, woman, get out of the way. Ah! And just she'll beat you to death uh, on the spot at the red light, and these women today have become much more uh, confident and assertive and stronger than men. I go to Bible colleges, and after preaching, young women come up to me, Brother Rossi, that was a great message. God bless you. Would you please sign my Bible? I shake their hand. Ow! I mean, Brother they Lee, reach out. Good job, Brother Rossi. That was great. And then a few little guys are standing in the back. Can I shake your hand too, Brother Rossi? And they walk out, hi, brother. And they look, man, they look like escapees from a Teletubby convention, amen? They look like sissies, amen? They look like effeminates. And they come walking up, hi, Brother Rossi. You say hi to the young man in the Bible college. Hey, son, what's your name? I'm, I'm not real sure. They don't even know their name. I mean, they have to look on their ID card. Oh, it's Joey. And they tell you their name, and they're backward. They're effeminate. They are weak. They won't look you in the eye. I've had young men say, hey, how you doing, son? Uh, hi. Say, hey, look right here. Hey, right here. Here. Look here. And uh, man, I remember the, the Ron Garris, Brock of Ages, prison ministry. He used to say, look at me and my God-given eyeballs. Hey, man. Hey, look right here, boy. And they're all looking all over the place. They can't even talk to you. They mumble when they speak. How are you, son? <laughs> what was that? Brother, the girls, hello, brother. God bless you. Amen. Shake that bush. Praise God. Come on. Amen. And uh, they're fired up about the preaching. The boys are in the back, half asleep, <laughs> lost. They don't even know their name. You say, why is that? Because over the last 30 years, they've been given a mega dose of Mr. Rogers, Barney and Friends, Teletubbies, 
these gender neutral TV shows that have taken young men instead of young men. Now we have feminized America. Brother, I don't know about you, it bothers me. We, have, we live in a neighborhood and down the street comes a little boy. He's on his little training wheel bicycle. He's got one of those weird looking little bicycle helmets on. Makes him look like an oversized bee walking down. He's got little uh, knee pads, sh elbow pads, shoulder pads. His mother's got him on a leash. Don't go too fast, Albert. I'm right behind you. And here comes the little mother right behind him. And he's, he's going down the street on his little bicycle. And you're going, what in the world is that? Brother, when we grew up, we never had any of those pads. Amen? We ran in the trees on purpose. I remember my first skateboard. It was a two-by-four with an old roller skate to use the key to open it up with. We took it apart, nailed it onto the, to the board, went straight down a hill. We were so smart, we'd go as fast as we could until we hit something and crashed. Amen? I mean, it was unbelievable. We didn't have little child safety restrictions. There was no such thing as car seats. We set them up there in the little shelf in the back window. Stay up there. And uh, drove down with no air conditioning down to Ocean City. They were sunburnt before we got to the beach. Amen? And uh, brother, turn them over real good. Let them rotisserie on the way. I mean, brother, we didn't have all this safety restraint and this ridiculous, uh, all these new rules and regulations. You say, oh, brother, you're just a redneck. No, there's a difference. I remember playing ball. We go to the side of the house, turn on the hose, and uh, drink water right out of the hose. Amen to that. How many of you ever drank water out of the hose? Amen. You look pretty good to me, or at least some of you do. And I mean, brother, uh, we didn't die from that. Nowadays, they go to, oh, excuse me, I want Evian. I want Fiji water. Excuse me, I only drink Dasani. And they drink a $2 bottle of water. When uh, we used to grow up, brother, we'd drink it out of the hose, out of a bucket. We'd go to the cooler and all playing ball, just drink it. Man, did you ever see kids that come over to the side of the cooler and the stuff they do to a cooler and we drink out of it anyway? I mean, brother, we live to talk about it. Amen. Amen. Yeah. We grew up in Parkville. Up on Linwood Avenue, off of Hartford Road, my dad had a hunter fan in the window. There was no such thing as air conditioning when I was a little boy. Didn't exist. I remember the first Sears air conditioner that went in the window. We'd always blow the fuses and couldn't use it anyway. But that old Hunter fan, brother, we'd get near that fan and watch it going. And just, man, we'd just put our little hands up to there. My mom said, don't put your fingers in that fan. There was no childhood safety restraint on the fan. If you stuck your finger in the fan, you would now wave to your friends. How's it going? And, uh, and kids in school would come in all bandaged up uh, because of the fact they didn't obey the rules about the fan. And friends, we lived in a different world, but now we live in an effeminate society. The Apostle Paul writing to another effeminate society there at Corinth, who've been invaded with early, much earlier uh, days of humanism and ungodliness and feminism, he said, quit you like men. He said, it is time for you to man up. May I give you a few areas where we need to quit like men tonight. Number one, we need to man up. We need to quit like men in our fight. This is a battle. This is no longer a playground. This is a battle. We've got casualties falling around us. We've got good men. I'm not even going to talk to you about the, the marriages that I speak to and uh, the people that I address whose lives are falling apart, the families that are falling apart. I'm not going to even get into all that with you tonight. I'm telling you, we are in an all, uh, no holds barred, all out brawl until these last days. And it's time for some of us to get up and start fighting. Do I have an Amen. And the Bible says, fight the good fight of faith. Lay hold on eternal life. Many of us are fighting the wrong thing. You're fighting with one another. You're fighting other Christians. You're fighting with people who are sitting in your pew and you want that seat. You're fighting for a place of preeminence on the platform where they'll recognize you and acknowledge you. I'm not talking about that fight. I'm talking about the battle that exists tonight between the world, the flesh, and the devil. And God said, quit you like men in your fight. 
In September of 1776, Pastor Me Peter Muhlenberg, the Presbyterian pastor uh, near uh, down in Virginia, uh, walked into his pulpit and preached a famous sermon entitled, A Time for All Things, from the book of Ecclesiastes. The time to fight, the time to, or time to live, the time to die, a time to plant, a time to reap. Went through that great famous sermon of his. When he got to the end, he said, gentlemen, the time to fight is now. And he took off his preaching gown, of which they wore in those days, reached behind the pulpit and pulled out a musket and said, I will meet in the town square and we will begin the Virginia militia, the Virginia colony militia right there. And they did, fought against the British and won the war. And Pastor Muhlenberg was one of the greatest soldiers America ever produced. Why? He said, it's time to quit laying around, brothers. It is time to fight. Do I have an amen? We've We've got a nation that's on its way to hell. We've got a generation that's on its way to a lake of fire. We've got a city in Baltimore that's on its way to an outer darkness where there's weeping and wailing and gnashing of teeth. And it's going to be a battle for you to run a bus. It'll be a battle for you to be a soul winner. But it is time to quit like men and fight. Amen. Amen. Quit you like men in your fight. Amen. Quit you like men over your faith. Fight the good fight of faith. 1 Timothy 6.12. One writer, Albert Barnes, said, Your cause is good. It is the faith. The religion of Jesus. He is your captain in the field. And should you even die in the field, the victory is yours. Friends, there's no such thing as if we die with our boots on, if we die holding our Bible, and I'm not talking about an NIV or some other newfangled Bible, I'm talking about the Word of God. Say amen. The inspired, I said inspired, the inspired, oops, I'm stuck, inspired, preserved, authoritative, perfect Word of God, King James Bible. Say amen to that. And I say tonight, if we die with this under our arm, and we die with tracks in our pocket, and we die running our bus route, teaching our Sunday school class, helping out the Christian school, being a blessing in the nursery. If we die in our place in church and some maniac comes in and open fire and kills two or three of us, let me just say this to you, it'll be worth it all. We will be absent from the body and present with the Lord. And friends, I don't want to die on an ash heap. Do I have an amen? It is the faith to quit you like men. And what we believe about Christ, about God, His Word, quit you like men over your family. To take a stand and the man up in your family. It is not time for men to go home and say, bless God, woman, I'm in, char I'm in charge around here. It's not what I'm talking about. I'm talking about the husband to be the head of a wife. I'm talking about the wife to be in submission to her husband. I do not mean, ladies, that you're supposed to let men walk all over you. You're not supposed to let your husband treat you poorly and abuse you and verbally or emotionally abuse you as, as a Christian. I'm talking about where we mutually love and respect and submit ourselves one to another in the fear of God. I need some help right here. And for us to treat what's with one another with the respect that all of us rightly deserve as a child of God. Hey, you're messing around with one of God's children. Do I have an amen? When you abuse that other person, when you rebuke that, uh, that other, you, when you rebuke your spouse and mistreat your spouse and disrespect your spouse, you are speaking to a member of the body of Christ. You are fooling around with his body, his flesh, his bones. And we ought to live in such a way that we love one another and love our children. And children, obey your parents in the Lord, for this is right. And to man up in our families. How many believe our families need some help? Yeah. I'm not going to ask how many of your families need help. I would never embarrass you with that. But don't quit out. Don't give up. Don't just say, well, I just quit, brother. That's a cowardly way out. Somebody say amen. amen. Heard about a leader who recently said, well, I've been trying to obey the rules all my life. I just felt like it was too tiresome to saw thought I ought to break them. You know what that is? That's a coward. That's a weak individual. Say amen. There's more involved here than you. Say amen to that. There's more involved here than just what you want and what your flesh desires and your little hurt feelings and on and on. It is time for us to man up in our families. But then we must man up, and I'm almost done, over our flesh. 
time to man up over this fleshly nature and this Adamic body. Friends, your flesh will kill you. Do I have an amen? amen. Romans 13, 14, but put you on the Lord Jesus Christ to, and, and make not provision for the flesh to fulfill the lust thereof. I've had people say, well, Brother Ross, you don't understand. I just wanted this. I just wanted to do this. And friend, just because we want something or just because we like something or something looks good to our eyes, it does not mean it's condoned by the Word of God. We need to say by the grace of God, I'm going to walk in the Spirit and not fulfill the lust of the flesh. For the flesh lusteth against the spirit, and the spirit against the flesh. These two are contrary one to the other, so that you cannot do the things which you would. You know the word lusteth means literally that the flesh is at war against the spirit of God in your life, and that you're, the spirit of God is at war against your flesh, and they'll never, never, they'll never be uh, 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 reconciled. You have to put your flesh to death daily. You say, preacher, I like to sleep. Yes? So, so does every sluggard. Do I have an amen? amen? Come on now, help me out. Well, I need a lot of sleep, not according to the Bible. And the Bible said, the sluggard shall not plow by reason of the cold, therefore shall he beg in the harvest and have nothing. It bothers me to call young men in the summertime, hey, what are you doing, son? Nothing. Really? Nothing? No, nothing. You call them, you know they just woke up 10.30 in the morning, summer day. How you doing there, son? Uh, what are you up to? Nothing. Oh, good. Who are you with? Nobody. Okay, great. Well, hey, we're going to go soul winning. Well, I'm busy. <laughs> Wait a minute. I thought you were doing nothing with nobody a minute ago. Now, all of a sudden, you're busy. Well, I've got to do this, and I've got to do that, and I've got to exercise, and I've got to take a shower, and I've got to clean myself up, and I've got to get in shape, and I've got to... No, friend, your flesh ought to take second place and second priority to the calling and the goodness and the commandments of God in your life. And by the way, young man, you ought to be up on, in the morning. Say amen to that. Amen. amen. Sit up half the night, tour of duty, area 41, <laughs> playing video games, <laughs> uh, filling your mind up with violence and ungodliness and cursing and profanity. No wonder you have a bad temper. Say amen to that. Oh, thank you all three of you. I said say amen to that. Amen. Maybe I should stay there a minute. Think I ought to stay on that for a minute. And there you are sitting at home with your big screen TV. You've got popcorn all over the floor. You've made a mess of your mama's house. You've got drinks all over the place. And your little mind is caught up with this ridiculous video game. Understand, friends, I've seen some of those. And those video games, some of them are so ungodly and so offensive to a Christian man and so offensive and contrary to the Word of God with profanity and images that have no business in the mind and heart of a child of God. Amen. Hey, stay up there. I'll need you in a minute. Sit right there. And I'm saying tonight, it is time for God's people to realize we're either going to wage war against our flesh or we're going to lose this battle. Somebody say amen. amen. What's considered normal TV viewing. When I grew up as a kid, we would have blown the front right out of the TV. We would have considered it to be pornography with the nakedness and ungodliness and the perversion and the, porno and the profanity. We would have blown the front right out of the TV set. But a little bit at a time, we've gotten used to things that have placed us in the category of a Corinthian society. We're now the reenactment of Corinth. Do you know that $3,075 is spent every second in America? on internet child pornography. That means we're not only rotten, we're rotten to the core, friends. It means we have given ourselves to the debauchery of the flesh in such incredible ways that now men, instead of normal, uh, what we would call normal temptation, have gone on to weird and strange and perverted stuff. That's why we are in such grave danger tonight. For your, for your flesh, you need to man up. You need to quit you like men and man up over these things. Ephesians 4.22, the Bible says that you put, a, that you put off concerning the, uh, concerning the 
the old nature, nature the old man which is corrupt according to the, the according to the and be renewed in the spirit of your mind and God said that you're to put on a new man which after God is created in righteousness and true holiness let me say this to you tonight it is time for us to put on our new man our new nature and be renewed in the spirit of our mind do I have an amen, amen. getting really quiet in the house of God tonight and friends, if we've got leaders falling prey to this awful stuff, what do you think's happening down in the pew? What do you think's happening down there with John Q. Church member? And brothers, you ought not to be texting women. Say amen to that. Amen. Let me try it again. You ought not to be texting women. Amen. Women, you ought not to be texting men that are not your husband. We've got so many means and so many ways. And men and women, you ought to be accountable to one another. You ought to be clearly accountable uh, to each other. What we have on our email, what we have on our texts, what we have in our lives. Why? Because we are in a battle against the world, the flesh, and the devil. Amen. I have no problem with my wife looking whatever's on my cell phone. Say amen to that. If accidentally somebody texts me, what's this all about? And so we need to man up. We need to quit like men in our flesh. And then, of course, we need to quit like men about our future. What's going to happen in the days ahead? What's going to happen to America? What's going to happen in this great nation? How many of you still love America? Amen? How many of you love this nation? And I'm not sure where we're going, friends. I'm not real sure that the salt and the light we once were are going to have the impact that we once had. I'm not absolutely sure that we can just simply get up and get ourselves ready and have revival whenever we want to. Maybe that we become like Samson, that we wish not that the Lord has departed. And we're going to stand up and shake ourselves and try to make something happen. We may be a little bit too late. And it may be that in reality, our nation, as we have known it, is gone. You say, preacher, that ought to discourage you and make you quit right now. No, not according to this verse. Watch ye, stand fast in the faith, quit you like men, be strong. When I grew up as a little boy in Parkville, Maryland, I remember the great nation that we once were. I remember some of the great presidents. I remember as a young Christian the day that President Ronald Reagan took office. <laughs> Just a few weeks later, guess what happened? He destroyed and put aside the big gas crunch that we had. Gas prices dropped immediately. The economy exploded instantaneously. Hey, that's what happens when a good man gets into office who, who literally does what he said he would do. Do I have an amen? But I'm not sure that we have a Ronald Reagan waiting in the wings. I'm not sure that we have some of the great men that America's produced waiting on the sidelines. Instead, we have really a, basically a Mormon and a Muslim. It's not real exciting. Do I have an amen? It's what we have facing us this November. And friends, tonight, I would say to every one of us, we need to stand fast, quit like men. We need to watch. We need to be strong. Because our future, even though temporarily we might have to go through some very difficult times, our future is settled in our Lord Jesus Christ. Our future is as bright as the promises of God because very soon now Jesus is going to come. Earlier on in chapter 15, and I'll close, he said, Behold, I show you a mystery. For we shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed. Friends, we're not all going to die. Not every person in this room, likely, there are many in this room that are going to get raptured out of this world. I believe that. We shall not all sleep. We shall all be changed. Some people put that on their baby room, on their, on their children, on their diapers. But we shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed in a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trump. For the trumpet shall sound, and the dead shall be raised incorruptible, and we shall be changed. For this corruptible must put on incorruption, and this mortal must put on immortality. Pastor, I'm looking forward to that day when Jesus comes. I know one thing, when he gets here, you'll never carry a cane again. 
You'll never have to visit that doctor. Do I have an amen? amen? You'll visit the great physician who heals the sick, the lost he came to save. Some of you right now that are battling physical affliction. Some of you right now that just getting up in the morning is a major event. Just getting out of the bed. You get out of the bed in the morning. First, you got to find your glasses. Then you have to find your teeth. Then you have to find your hearing aids. And you stumble over there to the medicine cabinet. You take a little bit of this medicine and that. Get yourself moving, taking all your meds, drink some coffee. Then you make your way back to your bed. By the time you're done all that, you need a nap. Amen to that. And uh, I mean, brother, one of these days, this mortal is going to put on immortality. And this corruptible will put on incorruption. Let me go back to Sunday school, give you this illustration, and we'll be closed. Did you know that there are many of the metaphors in the Scripture that tie in one with another? We learned this morning about the Christian life being a runner and a race, and of course we're learning tonight about you and I are soldiers in a battle. A Greek race, when it was all finished, they would run their course and they would lay it all out. There were several towers along that course with the judges in the tower. And in each one of those towers, as the judge looked down, he would watch the, run the runners and make sure they ran properly and ran within the boundaries and in the course. As they watched the runners, and finally they came all the way around the marathon, the long race, and finally got to the end. When they crossed the finish line, that one who was first would run across that finish line. You've seen them with their uh, chest outstretched in order to break the tape and all that. Very similar thing. When they crossed the finish line, the very last tower was there at the finish line. And the judge looking down, who sat on a seat that was literally called the judgment seat or the Bema seat, he would look down, and as they crossed, he would appoint the runner, and he would appoint the winner of the race. He would say these words, and literally they translate out exactly like this. Come up hither. And the man who was called to the bema seat, to the judgment seat, he would climb up to the tower, and they would place a laurel wreath on his head, and they would say these words, well done, good and faithful servant. That is exactly the words that the judge would use. Our Lord Jesus Christ applying that very same principle, that very same illustration. He said that when we stand before him, some of us are going to hear those words. When we get to the judgment seat of Christ, go home and read the book of Revelation, you'll hear those very words where at the rapture he says, come up hither, and he brings them up into heaven itself. And I don't know about you, but I want one of those wreaths to be placed on my head where he looks down and places that crown on us, the laurel crown, the wreath, and he says, well done, good and faithful servant. Enter thou into the joy of thy Lord. Watch ye, stand fast, quit you like men, be strong. Let's bow our heads tonight and our hearts together in prayer. I had much more I could preach on this. Several illustrations to make this even clearer in our minds, but all over the room and all over the auditorium.